glitch there, but you know, this is always the way. Body image is a big topic and a confusing one. So everyone has a different story and many of us need to fill some gaps into what we need to know about our own bodies. So to add value to you all today, we're delighted to have Dr. Hayley O'Neill join us as our guest expert. Uh, she'll talk about um, all things metabolism, lean muscle, body fat and weight loss and her years of um, research and hands-on experience in these areas. But more particularly, she's here uh, to answer any questions that you may have um, so that you can actually get the right answers and apply them immediately to your own uh, health and fitness plan. My name is Caroline Barton and I'm one of the managing partners of Smart Coach 7 along with my business partner Susan Sheehan who will lead today's um, session. So if you have any questions or comments just pop them in the chat box here on Zoom and these will be covered off later in the session. Welcome to those of you joining us live on Facebook. So hello Susan um, and welcome again and I'll, I'll look forward here to handing over to you to introduce our Dr Hayley O'Neill. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Caroline, or good evening, because, you know, wherever you are in the world, it's either good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and I'll get straight into it. Hi, Hayley, how are you this morning? Very well, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm excited that you're here with us this morning because, you know, the whole body body dilemma you know and I was thinking about it yesterday you know how many times a day do people think about their body you know when they're ordering lunch having breakfast out for dinner can't do that oh shouldn't do that oh my gosh you know and, and all of this stuff that goes on in their head open their wardrobe love to wear that can't wear that never wear that you know there's all of all of this programming and then there's the tv you know the the woman shake the man shake the this diet the that diet the this food delivery that food delivery it goes on and on and on and on so you know the question i've put out there is how many times a day because of what's going on because of all of that confusion out there in the marketplace how many times a day do you actually think about what's going on with your body it's 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 really quite a great question to ask mm -hmm. and of course how it would be interesting to think about or to know what the percentage of people that said oh my gosh a dozen times a day and the effect that that then has on mm -hmm. what their body how they actually the results they get with their body because if you're always thinking about what you can't do shouldn't do better not do be told not to do oh my gosh I didn't do that and I read that and I saw that you know how is that how is that affecting the programming of what you actually do do now this this has been going on in my head and as I've grown up most most people know that I've grown up in the health and fitness industry um, and what I'm blown away with and that's why I'm so excited to have you here 20 years ago I would I would preach coach teach speak exactly what you today are telling us that research tells us that is real and true so evidence-based research can now confirm uh, mm -hmm. that lean muscle is a good thing to have. So get out there, do a push-up, do a lunge, but mm -hmm. there's so much more to it than that. Mm -hmm. So let's get into, into this. Hayley, you know, let's just go back to the very beginning. How did you get into being interested <laughs> about metabolism and weight loss and, and body fat and all of that stuff? Yeah, probably um, growing up, like I'm Italian background, my mum's Italian. And so growing up around food, and it was always like, eat, eat more, eat more. And if you know, I had to train myself to eat slower. So your plate didn't get, you know, filled up two or three times. And I guess um, I always played a lot of sport, like grew up in the country, um, so very active, um, you know, everything from netball, volleyball. Uh, and, yeah, so pretty active. Like my mum was a really great cook, so I guess passion for food and that came from there. Um, and, yeah, I, I just had an interest in combining the two because, 
you, you see these people working out a lot, but then their diet's not so good and then they don't get any progress with their, you know, improving how they look and feel. So I think I, I've probably had that probably come from my mum around food and eating and body image. And it's a bit different to how, like I don't use the word fat and stuff around my kids and that now. And I really encourage eating and even the work that I'm doing with my clients and in clinical trials really changing perceptions of about weight so obviously that that led to doing I did a bachelor's in biomedical science but choosing a lot of subjects around nutrition dietetics majored in physiology and chemistry and I was actually told to pick a pick a proper disease by a lot of my lecturers when I would choose obesity and I so and I didn't listen so I sort of paid my own way and then I I was doing a lot of work with, um, had an opportunity with um, Professor Karen O'Day, who has really done some great research in Australia around Indigenous health and um, antioxidants. And I really, she put me in contact with um, a really young investigator who studied a lot about muscle metabolism and um, physiology and exercise and obesity, but in um, mouse models. So I I did my honours degree all looking in muscle and metabolism, um, characterising, you know, fat burning and, um, you know, if you you make the mice fat with feeding them a high-fat diet and then you study whether, you know, by knocking out certain proteins in the pathway that are thought to be involved in fat burning, um, do you really get the results that you think? And obviously there's all these compensatory mechanisms that sort of go on. So I led to that and I did a PhD um, looking at the role of this protein called AMP kinase in exercise and contraction. And so you're all looking to for new novel um, obesity strategies or therapies, um, but also, you know, potentially to enhance exercise. So you know, by the end of my PhD, I'd characterised lots of different mouse models, really looked at um, these two pathways in how, you know, fat burning and, um, you know, carbohydrate burning basically in muscle. And then I went on to looking at in my first postdoc, I was fortunate enough to get an HMRC fellowship and I was characterising all these novel hormone receptors and fat cells and because we know when we get fat or we get you know have obesity carry excess weight that our fat tissue is also an endocrine organ and it expands and it contracts and all that so i've done a lot of stuff around fat biology and then a cell biology and you know really in-depth mechanistic stuff um spent three times in uh, three years in canada um during my phd then come back to Australia and then I moved. um, I thought, you know, what does all this mean in humans? So really closing that gap, I really wanted to bring more mechanism to really understand in depth, understanding what's going on, what's driving people's weight loss and their inability to lose weight. So I was fortunate enough to um, be involved in some really big um, million dollar studies, um, in Queensland and applied clinical research, translational research, um, and looking at really hands-on um, ways that people can lose weight through dieting without with reducing the um, this plateauing effect that you get as you continue with the traditional restriction of calories week after week. So really novel novel ways through intermittent approaches approaching to dieting and also I've looked at surgical weight loss so um, bariatric surgery because this was this is an area that's not really well studied and I started this like quite a few years ago um, taking you know muscle and fat biopsies and blood a range of biospecimens to really put it all together and appreciate that obesity or trying to lose weight is more than just eating or restricting your calories and you know moving less it it, um you know has so many different different components to it and you know working with participants in clinical trials you really see their struggles and how it affects every component of their life and basically they go to their doctors and told you know, well, you just need to lose weight or exercise more or eat better. And, and it's, it's, 
very disheartened because they feel like a failure. And I'm going to share with you today that basically it doesn't matter what diet you do, like the, the fundamentals of what makes a successful diet. Um, and it really, it's really hard to achieve. And um, it comes down to the individual, basically. So that's sort of my journey. And then I've gone into, you know, since finishing my five year postdoc, I've gone into um bit of business and that's why that's how I've met Susan so plant-based supplements and then weight loss for busy women and busy mums um really that personalized um approach um nutrition and stress and hormones and you know really developing that beautiful lifestyle rhythm that suits every you know everyone is different and really you know, tapping into those triggers and mapping it all back, what getting to the root cause of why we women or as an individual have struggled their whole life trying to lose weight, this whole yo-yo dieting effect. Um, so that's that's sort of my backstory. Like I like to talk. So if anyone has like questions, put them in. Like if anything is resonating um, with you around what I'm, you know, talking about. So Okay, sorry, big yeah. noise, big black shut door. Um, okay, so, well, thank you. Now, let's just break that up a little bit yeah. because of a lot of our listeners, they would have just thought of that as a lot of goobly gook and what does it mean to me? So, so let's, <laughs> let's, break it, let's break it down into um, grade seven language. One thing we know for sure is that you know your stuff um, yeah. and that is why you're here today. You really know what it, what it all, it's, it's all about. So let's just break it up into uh, in, into bite-sized pieces, grade seven language, so yeah. that we can really give our listeners, you know, some of the facts about what they may need to know to do better. Yeah. Because as as we've discussed, there's so much stuff out there. It's like yeah. what 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 does work, what doesn't work. Yeah. So you said you said that you know it's very individual. We know yeah. that. So what we've always said, you've got to listen to your own body. That's number one, isn't it? Really to listen to your own body so tell us why diets don't work okay why diets don't work well getting back to what you said at the start how many times a day do people think about oh I shouldn't eat this or good foods or bad foods and it's a whole like decades of misinformation and conditioning that you know I, I even in the office place, when you're bringing in cakes and there, there'd be at least like 20% of people or women who say, oh, I'm not going to have that because I'm trying to lose weight. And, 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 I, and it actually the evidence shows that when you become more fixated on what not to eat, you end up overeating anyway. So that's sort of the first thing. Um, the second thing is that the body is very clever. clever. Um, it is wired to protect us. So as soon as we start reducing our calories or trying to lose weight, all these things in the body happen. We get changes in hormones. We get um, more efficient at burning our energy. We might move less. Um, you know, the changes in hormones drive us to want to eat more sweet, fatty foods. Um, our metabolism slows. So the, the amount of energy that we're burning when we're just not doing anything slows down. So what happens is our weight starts to go down and then we start to plateau, which means our weight's not, we don't lose weight anymore, like the weight rate of weight loss slows down. And then we start to regain it. And then this classic... Um, you know, it's not that we're just failing. There's all these things going on in the body um, that drive us to want to eat more to sort of like prevent starvation, basically. So um, I've got one about gut health. So this is this is another thing that I'm very interested in. So we've got, you know, fixation on food. We've got eating behaviour, individualised different eating behaviour. We've got psychology, you know, having excess weight and obesity is associated with depression or anxiety. And we do see um, that a lot, a lot of um, patients or participants on any de depressants. And then this will, this sort of gets into the gut health stuff as well, which is an area that I've also studied. And let's, uh, let's, let's, yes. let's, let's yeah. just, let's just yeah. keep, keep that breaking up. So yeah. yeah so so that's wow you know what we're um, we're going to be uh, you can talk as much as I can talk so let's just yeah. let's play a game of tennis yeah. match yes. and forwards yeah. because 
you've got you've got so much knowledge and so much information that everybody out there needs to hear so okay so we know that the way you think about food is really important and you know tell us what is the difference between i i've always called it um heavy eating to planned eating so planned eating is when you stick to a plan you know you have you have your meals planned out certain times of the day same times of the day every day compared to heavy eating in my interpretation of that is see food eat food mm -hmm. um you know you're, you're you're motivated to eat because you've seen an ad because you like the food because you're emotional eating because of any other chemistry in your body that's causing you to 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 want to have those sugary fat foods yeah. so how important is it to be a planned eater compared to a heavy eater um when it comes to managing your weight and what's going on yes. you know um underneath the surface Yes, well, that's definitely a concept that a concept that I adopt um, with my clients, like meal planning and knowing, you know, what how much range they can have and really rewiring themselves in the way they eat. Um, when I've done clinical trials, where we we prescribe them with a the food and the, the diet or the program or the food to eat, but we're not telling them when to eat. But what has happened over the years in the last two decades, and this gets into gut health too, we've evolved and developed that we're eating all day, right? Right, like I think our feeding window is like 14, 12 to 14 or 16 hours, which means that we're not allowing our gut or our digestive system to really um, do its thing because we're constantly eating we're not allowing breaks and we're also having a lot of fast food which means we're providing energy rapidly so that we're all the good fiber um, food the grains the prebiotic fiber that we get in our diet is not actually getting to the bottom of our gut where the gut microbes do its thing to then regulate everything from metabolism, um, appetite, immunity, inflammation. So that, that that's one thing with our eating habits. Um, and we also have um, within our tissues, um, how can I explain this simply, like little clocks in in our all our organs or all our tissues, our stomach, our liver. And the main driver of that is food. So this, you know, our body works on a 24 hour clock, you know, hormone levels change throughout different times of the day. Food is a big stimulus for changing these like internal clocks. So if we're eating like it did, you know, if we're skipping meals, if we're eating all the time, this can call, cause changes in these clocks. And, you know, two hormones that I've studied um, one more than the other is cortisol. So cortisol, so really looking at the relationship between stress and weight. And cortisol is a hormone that peaks in the morning and then goes down throughout the day, whereas melatonin is in the reverse. And then you've got serotonin in there too. And then this is all linked to gut health and mood and things like that. But if you, you know, we if we think, we always think of our hormones um, just being the same all the time but they're actually fluctuating and changing all throughout the day and in response obviously to food as well so yeah meal like meal plans and obviously eating in front of the tv a lot of women um, and men as well will snack at night time so in front of the tv lose track of their calories but then they'll you know, go to bed late, wake up, skip breakfast, might have a coffee. This is a classic, um, you know, yo-yo diet or a woman who's having issues with weight, skip breakfast, have coffee, don't eat much during the day. I might have a salad, a protein bar. Then they think I've done so well all day. I'll have a wine, I'll have this. And then, you know, the start, you know, they're hungry and their energy is low in the afternoon and then they just eat everything in sight. So definitely having a plan um, to stick to is important. But knowing, you know, having enough flex in it that you're not becoming bored because this is the thing where women and men, they fall down with dieting is they become bored. It's the adherence and the compliance, okay, because it's too restrictive. Like it might work for a few weeks, but then it falls down. So it's about rewiring and knowing your limits and looking at the long-term goal and definitely having a plan does help with that. But 
I, I think, you know, to live your life always to a certain plan, like you, social occasions or things like this, you need to have flex. And this is what I do. The work with my clients is knowing limits and not eliminating chocolates or wine or whatever cheese, whatever they want to have, um, you should still be able to have these foods um, in your everyday. So it's interesting about the hormones because mm. you know, I always say hormones are things that you can't, uh, that you don't want to live with, but you can't live without. So, um, you know, because they, they really sort of cause you to feel all these different ways. So if cortisol peaks in the morning, mm. then, and you go to bed worrying about your weight, worrying about your problems, you go to bed thinking about, oh my gosh, I feel fat oh my gosh what do I have to do then you're going to be be creating a greater level of cortisol when you wake up in the morning would that be correct so so yeah. here comes here comes the idea of course which we tell all our clients is go to go go to bed with happy thoughts mm -hmm. and if you if you go to bed with happy thoughts you're thinking about how much you love yourself not how much weight you need to lose mm -hmm. you go to bed loving who you are rather than thinking about what's not working is that going to reduce the cortisol peak in the morning yeah we will we'll, um i studied this a lot like a couple of years um to try and figure out whether you know someone loses more weight because their cortisol response is different definitely anticipation of the day ahead increases cortisol um People who have excess weight or obesity, I found that they have a blunted cortisol awakening response. So when it peaks, like compared to like a healthy person that would have an increase, um, these healthy women that like it did blunt. And then when they lost weight, it did restore. The problem is with cortisol, and I know women and people do get it measured or the doctor says, oh, I'll measure your cortisol. I found like about a 40% variation in an individual, like with the measure alone from day to day. So it's a very noisy measure because it's going up and then coming down. You need to measure it at multiple times of the day. Just coming into the lab or, or to get your bloods done actually increases your cortisol. So I think that it's been hard to measure. There are studies that have shown, yes, relationship between obesity and differences in cortisol, but it is hard to measure. And I think it's more complex than that. Like there are studies that are ongoing around glucocorticoids or cortisol and weight, um, but, but definitely... I know there are people that when you're stressed, you eat more unhealthy foods or you'll lose that um, awareness of what you're putting in your mouth. Um, people might drink alcohol more, which is really high in calories. Um, so, yeah, eating behaviour. Like I think when you nut it down, though, it's like looking at the triggers. What are the things that are driving you to when you're having appetite? Look at what else you're eating in your diet or cravings or things like that. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. That track came back. Um, because because we know that cortisol, too much cortisol is toxic waste. We know that, you know, it, it's looking at the body holistically, isn't it? Because if we're happier, then we're certainly going to be more focused on doing what we need to do. And you haven't got that that emotional eating and that stress, the stressors of eating. So, mm -hmm. so really simply, just what you're saying here is that planned eating um, is a healthier option as long as you have flexibility mm -hmm. and that there are times that you actually give your digestion digestive system a break mm -hmm. so that the gut can heal a little bit and it, everything can renew mm -hmm. uh, so and as long as in that plan you're eating good clean healthy food um, then that is a really good place to start okay mm -hmm. now let's look at lean muscle and and body fat I know that using the word fat in context of oh my gosh don't do that because you're too fat we know that that is just not something that you ever do ever um, so be aware of language we also know that the way you talk to yourself is so powerful so even if you're feeling fat guys tell yourself you're you're slim trim and terrific or whatever that means to you but let's look at lean muscle versus uh, versus what body fat and the importance of developing lean muscle mm -hmm. yeah so what happens um, when we gain weight predominantly it's fat or fat tissue and our fat tissue is made up of lots of little cells and they're called fat cells and they they predominantly hold fat 
but they also produce a number of hormones um, and things that are either good or bad, pro or anti-inflammatory, they're called cytokines, okay? So as we expand and we get fatter, our fat cells get larger and, and it's quite, um, you know, there's a lot of remodeling of this tissue and I've looked at, um, you know, things that are really driving um, changes in fat. But what happens, you know, so it can expand and contract as much as, you know, we put on weight and lose weight. Um, we get more fat cells in addition to them becoming larger. But then sometimes when the excess or the surplus is too much, um, we start, they, they, the fat cells become angry and fat can actually start spilling out over the fat cells and start accumulating in other tissues such as uh, liver and muscle. So I've done a lot of research on muscle because what actually happens when, when the fat's spilling over into muscle, it can start producing these things called bioactive lipids or lipid species, and they can shut down um, different components of insulin signaling. And this is what um, our insulin signaling, what happens is that's really important for clearing sugar or glucose from the blood so that the, the muscle becomes insulin resistant because it doesn't respond to the same amounts of insulin anymore. So when, when you're eating a meal, for example, you get a spike in blood sugar and then insulin's produced by the pancreas to clear that clear that sugar and then be taken up into muscle or other tissues um, to to um, you know be used as energy so what happens when we start to um, lose so we're becoming you know fatter um, our body weight's increasing predominantly that's fat then we want to lose weight so what what happens and we might be pre-diabetic or insulin resistance so as soon as we start to restrict our calories as i said our metabolic rate drops we do, the predominant amount of weight that we are losing is our fat mass or our fat tissue, we're losing fat, but we can also lose some muscle. And this is not good because um, in addition to our muscle being the main driver that's regulating those blood sugar levels or insulin sensitivity, it's also um, plays an important component in our energy metabolism or energy expenditure, like our metabolic rate. Okay, so the more muscle we have, um, the higher our metabolic rate will be. So we start restricting our calories, we get a drop in metabolic rate. Predominantly, that's driven by the loss in muscle. Um, so if we're not... Um, one of the things we've shown as well, that if you're not getting enough protein in your diet to support that, that muscle, so we know protein is important for muscle mass, um, you can actually lose greater amounts of muscle. So does that make sense? So that's, yeah. No, muted again. Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Um, what the, that big track would have to come today, this morning, yeah. right now. Anyway, um, so we over we overeat, we move less. Yes. Um, the aging process sets in, mm -hmm. and body fat, the weight goes up, but the body fat, the fat cells not only duplicate, but they also get fatter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which of course creates this imbalance, and the more that you actually sit mm -hmm. and and eat the wrong foods, and the more that this behavior continues. Mm -hmm. these fat cells then also spill out and start to affect the other parts of the body i.e lean muscle um, and I guess that's why so many diets out there somebody may lose body fat but their muscle looks like oh my gosh you know they could do with eating a eating a hunk of steak or something because you can see that they need to increase their lean muscle um, it's an interesting it's it's an interesting thing to watch so if the, if the fat cells not only duplicate but get fatter how does how does how do you reduce that how do you slow that down what 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 is the what would you suggest if somebody is feeling fatter getting fatter um and they they're, they're listening to this and they now know that their fat cells are not only getting more but they're also getting bigger mm -hmm. what is what is how do you stop that that happening yeah so well 
calorie restriction is one of them. So there's, the, you know, in order to lose weight, and then this is where all the diet fads come in, which are a bit BS, um, so to speak. So what happens is in order to lose weight, we need to create an energy deficit. So that means um, we can either do that by exercising more or the other one um, is restricting our calories. So it's much easier to restrict our calories day after day than be creating the same deficit through exercise. Okay, so we start restricting our calories. We're losing weight. The predominant amount of weight is from our fat. So we're, we're burning, you know, as soon as you start restricting your calories, you, you see the switch from carbohydrate to burning more fat. Okay, so then what happens when the weight loss starts to, you know, plateau because our metabolic rate slows down, things like that, and we've lost, we've lost the weight, okay? So that's where the exercise then comes in important for maintaining the lost weight, also keeping the muscle metabolism and everything up, keeping the muscle mass up, as well as all the other um cardio respiratory benefits I guess um, but I still think if you don't develop better eating habits you just revert, revert back to the old eating habits as well so yes then you have to exercise once you've lost the weight but there's other thing um, called and you've probably heard of intermittent fasting um, in terms of intermittent fasting um, for weight loss, the evidence isn't that strong unless you're putting in, like restricting your calories into that intervention. So you might, and there's a lot of different interventions or different type, ways that people can try intermittent fasting. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it is really good for like a metabolic reset. Um, so really what how this um intermittent fasting approach came about they were actually study, studying cancer and they found every time they fasted or did this intervention in the mice they lost weight so that's how intermittent fasting approach um came about but in terms of improving your metabolism so how good everything's working and firing that is an approach that it can be quite effective for reducing lipids, helping with blood sugar regulation, um, giving that you know metabolic sort of reset. Because um, I think, and also aging in the mitochondria. I know there are stuff like fasting can be um, beneficial in in that respect as well. So there are a few different approaches. Um, do you want me to keep talking? Yeah, no, no, let's, yeah. let's, because I know the intermittent fasting thing mm. is like, you know, it's out there now, isn't it? And you hear the yep. answers, you know, uh, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Jackman, one of them, I know that um, his, his intermittent fasting plan has been all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, a lot of people think that they can fast until lunchtime, and then eat whatever they want. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know, so yes. That's the stuff food into my face, because yes. this is what intermittent fasting is all about. So what you're saying is, is that doing, putting in place that intermittent fasting occasionally is a healthy thing, as long as you're still working on healthy eating and caloric restrictions. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's all about just, just really giving that body a break sometimes so that your that gut and your whole system can sort of start to renew and recover. It isn't an opportunity to not eat and eat, then eat everything that you can. No, and that's what the evidence has shown. I know there are people that have done Quite. People like the intermittent fasting approach because it's, you have basically a feeding window, and whether that be six or eight hours or, you know, 10 hours, and depending on whether you uh, skip breakfast or don't skip breakfast, but because they're not restricted, you don't, you're not having to count or you, you just eat whatever, but they've shown that it, the weight loss can be slow with this intervention, um, if any. Um, and it comes down to comparing it against every other diet that the long-term evidence on weight, you know, when you're looking at weight loss, is it's not there or it's not strong, okay? Most, you know, 12 to or 8 to 16 weeks is the classic time period period. Um, 
in clinical research for weight loss interventions there are ones you know but the the, the longer time points is what you're interested in to, in because most people who la- lose as little as eight percent body weight regain that within two years um and then this this is a problem and a lot of that's to do with compliance lack of support you know adherence to the plan or the diet or they just don't think of the different stages of weight loss like i, I always call it like the the diet after the diet so what what's your strategy you know um so there's lots yeah lots to take into consideration and this is why you know we go restriction or we become fit you know juice cleansers or shake diets or that you know these or try all these different things we have success and then we you know our habits develop or and we've got even some of the hormone changes can persist up to six to 12 months um after dieting or calorie restriction so being aware of these things that when you start to gain weight that you will always regain some weight we even see that in patients who have undergone bariatric surgery this is just what the body does right so thinking not just about weight but it's like transforming your health transforming your lifestyle my program is all about like total body love lifestyle transformation so you're looking at every component that then yes you can lose the weight but then it's about you know the, the confidence to step into your dream job to set boundaries like all these other things like what's coming up from my childhood why am I getting these cravings why am I using food to soothe why you know and it's really good when these things come up within my clients because it's like great and they're thinking they're failing oh no I over ate or I just couldn't help myself but it's like okay well what's happened in your day or your week that's led you to do that let's work on minimizing this and i guess putting, yeah i guess i guess that's where that's where the coaching comes in isn't yeah. it but mm-hmm. it's also it's also isn't it about people what you just said here about it's not about i remember when i was studying i had i had a lecturer say to me study for knowledge not for an exam mm-hmm. and i think we can use that we could use that as an analogy here learn how listen to, learn what you how your body learn your body listen to your body learn how your body works mm-hmm. um and then put in a lifestyle plan that's going to give you the health fitness and body that you want forever rather than rather than just for a 12-week diet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and i think if we can i think this is i think this is the gem of today mm-hmm. if we can help more people really truly understand what that looks like and means to them and again doesn't it come down to you know as you said you know what is your dream job but Mm -hmm. what is it that you want to achieve in life and who do you need to be to have that let's look at what that means Mm -hmm. so lean muscle important Mm -hmm. uh you know so again it's back to that exercise Mm -hmm. you know what would you recommend as far as lean muscle versus cardiovascular exercise for weight loss and and getting this you know the biochemistry of the body doing what it's meant to do yes yeah so i've really changed since like I have a four and five year old now so that's really changed like since only a year apart so since going from yeah career woman to then this and just you know I don't have time to exercise all the more uh, all the time and I think the recommendations are it's like at least around like 200 minutes um a week like I don't do that all the time all the time and I I just think any exercise program like the best exercise program is one that gets done so you know like making sure even if you don't feel like you know going for a run I would say to one of my clients she's you know feeling so bad she has this gym gym membership and she's not using it and I said like it's okay I said even if you drive there and just sit in the car, like, you know, step by or walk through and just go, ride the bike or just just get there, like get into that pattern. Like I said, most people, I think the average person uses their gym membership once a day. You know, sometimes you're too exhausted to work out. So just go go for a walk or get outside or just, you know, I think our, our lifestyle, and I'm guilty of this as well, like sitting at a desk all day long now and most people are pretty busy or you don't have the energy or if you're carrying excess weight it is really hard to work out at a high intensity so um you know 
there, there are high intensity, like the HIIT training. I think that can be uh, not in terms of a stress response so beneficial, but it mightn't be realistic if you're, you know, 200 kilos, I don't think. Yeah, um, I, think, I, think, yeah. I think I think the exercise also comes down to who you are personally. Um, and again, we'll go back to the rule a little bit often. Um, keep it going so that it's part of your life rather than thinking when you go and do a hit a hit session, hit it, not being able to walk for a week and never do it yeah. again. So it's all about doing doing that little bit often. Okay, but developing lean muscle, maintaining lean muscle is a key, mm -hmm. um, and keeping that energy metabolism going. Yeah. Okay, now the other question um, that. And I know that Caroline will have a couple of questions and somebody on screen, um, questions come in from outside and then people on screen can ask. Um, and this is a big subject. So I know that this, we don't have time to go into this subject, but if you could nutshell hormones and weight loss, mm -hmm. hormones and metabolism, how, how powerful are hormones and how our bodies respond to losing weight? Yeah, I think they're obviously very important. We have lots of hormones in our body, some drive appetite, some regulate, you know, uh, fat burning or controlling our blood sugar levels, especially um, for women. And I will just touch on um, the intermittent dieting approach because I do talk about this with uh, my clients, um, with the skipping the breakfast in the morning and women are on, obviously we 20 eight day cycle our hormones are fluctuating all the time our energy requirements are different depending on what phase of our cycle so this is a bit of a tip like you when you're already under a bit of like metabolic stress or you know coming into your period for example um, you don't want to be restricting your calories okay so that's just and and by just, there is some evidence that when you are skipping breakfast in the morning as a woman it can lead to reproductive like sort of issues um, with your period and menstrual cycle as well so that's just one example um, and yeah, I think when we're, when we're starving ourselves, this is a classic thing that often people are not eating enough calories, okay? So we're in at this constant state of restriction. And when you, you put people on a even like a weight maintenance um, diet, so to speak, or intervention, they're, they're so surprised how much food they can actually eat. Yes. Okay. So, so, and when we're getting like to gut health, um, you know, we're thinking fiber and then protein, like with our muscle metabolism, I just wanted to mention as well, like that protein intake, like most of us from our normal diet will be getting enough protein um, just by our normal eating. Um, it's not essential that you have these super processed um, protein supplements. And there's a lot in this as well because that's the first thing that we go and do is we buy this expensive protein supplement which is filled with thickeners and um, additives and preservatives which can cause a lot of um, gastrointestinal upset um, inflammation gas bloating all this sort of stuff as well and we're actually sometimes like some I've heard of some people get on like 200 grams of like protein a day from their gym instructor and then the classic chicken and broccoli and and things like that so um, you know that we know our gut, like protein, yes, is digested in the gut, but um, having too much can lead to like inflammation and things like that. So this is all, you know, everything's linked. If you think about the body, where things are digested, you know, you've got stuff happening in your gut, but then it's going around um, to other parts, like in the brain. Um, we've got our gut-brain axis. Um, we've got inflammation in the gut. We've got metabolism, appetite, things like that. So, yes, hormones are very important, um, especially for women as our hormones changes. Like most women are not having enough fibre in their diet. Actually, 80% or 80% of um, people don't get enough fibre in their diet. We need that for our energy. We need that for regulating our um, bloods like our cholesterol levels and stuff in our blood as well as for women pulling out extra excess um, estrogen okay so when you're getting a build-up of estrogen you can be more irritable um, angry sort of mood um, constipated bloating because you're not going to the toilet enough so this is all linked in as well to 
yeah fiber intake and hormones. So, so, yeah. so it's interesting. It's interesting how how you, what you're saying here about hormones for women is that have periods. So just just a quick, um, I guess, summary of that is mm -hmm. that it really is important to again we go back to listening to what your body can do and can't do. You've got to listen to what your body can do, whether you're male or female. You know, you've got to listen to what your body, how your body uses energy, what foods, what what exercise, what hours, what what your time clock is doing so that you can work with your body i think that that's number one what you're what i'm hearing here um and of course hormones for women um mm -hmm. are already regulated because of that because of that cycle so when then women go into menopause and post menopause um where we're a hundred percent i've done a lot of research on this where a hundred percent of women over 40 at some stage whether they're this big or this big mm -hmm. will all have an increase in body fat yeah. um and there's a lot of reasons for this isn't it one of them is because i think they lose a pound of lean muscle a year if they don't do anything to increase that lean muscle um so therefore it's important then for women going through the stage of life to really again stop and listen to the, what what body's doing so they can adjust to those changes yeah yeah ab absolutely and that's and that's some of it like around that age at 40 to 50 like most women are approaching like bur burnout like their energy levels are changing they're they're gaining weight and they don't know why they're trying to control it with dieting you know there's there are a lot of changes going on but simple things like around diet like i think the worst thing can do is that you can restrict the amount of food that you're eating and when we're getting back to fiber and gut health and weight and obesity there's evidence shown that um that the you know you're having less variety of fruit and vegetables you're going to have less um types of microbes in your gut okay and then people with obesity have less diverse microbes in your gut okay the more diverse gut microbes you have like that's been linked to be more protective against disease um so that that yeah. simply means eat a rainbow yes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The variety and especially your green your leafy greens um yeah. flax is really good for hormone balancing in women like flax seeds um you know less processed foods less inflammation Yes, I think I think we could do a whole session on hormones. I know, and a lot of people have heard me say this. In fact, most people that have heard me speak heard me say this. That you know, I I used to be able to run without a bra on, 250 grew boobs. So you know, there's a there's a, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting subject matter. Okay, hands up, anybody who has a question for Haley, Caroline, what's coming from outside? Well, I think we've had most of them covered, but um, one here was I think you've. It was uh, how can you explain the process of fat loss mm -hmm. um, and how does the body work when losing weight? But more particularly, the, the question is around where does it go? Where does it go? Well, it's burnt as energy. So every yeah, yeah. So so we we can burn um, fat, we can burn muscle into like protein. Um, we all, we have um, carbohydrates storage form of glycogen that like everything gets burnt in the mitochondria that's like the powerhouse of the cell and i did a lot of like work in my phd on this so our fat goes into the circulation like as fatty free fatty acids taken up into muscle enters the mitochondria like broken down can enter the mitochondria and produce energy so we can live carry out normal body bodily functions yeah and i guess i guess for those who train and really do listen to their body this you you would really relate to the mitochondria as far as lactic acid because lactic acid is a byproduct of of that mitochondria burning that energy um because a buildup of lactic acid can cause tightness in the muscles etc cetera, etc cetera. so Mm -hmm. um yeah the mitochondria is an is an interesting 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 mm -hmm. subject matter um that's a really interesting question caroline where does it yeah. go i've never heard that question mm -hmm. before i love it yeah yeah well, so if it, we know that's the problem if you, muscle, yeah if, well if you're you, eating they lose a lot of weight and they've got a lot of skin folds and everything like that but <laughs> yes yeah well it's because you've you're you've had a significant restriction in your calories and this is a problem if you're eating you know, we can accurately measure how the energy requirements of a person um, through various ways. But if you're eating what 
you know, to maintain your body weight, that's why you don't lose weight because you're eating. And I think, you know, there is a threshold plus or minus that you can have each day and then not gain or lose weight. And that's where some people go, oh, I'm just doing everything I should be doing and I'm only eating 1,200 calories, but then I'm still gaining weight. But they might have had like a chocolate biscuit or something else that they don't think is significant. But when you look at it over the course of the week, it, it is significant. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I used to have um, cappuccino with triple chocolate um, until I until I did a study on sugar and I used to think a little bit is not going to hurt, a little bit's not going to hurt. And then when I did the study on sugar and it's like triple chocolate and you know at least one cappuccino a day, if I was seeing clients, it could be more. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's a heck of a lot of sugar that's just a little bit off. And so we have we have to be aware of that. Again, it's going back to how we how we talk to ourselves. Um, guys on screen, does, do any of you have a question for for Hayley. Tom. Uh, and we've got a couple in the um in the chat box there, so too. If you can read those out, Caroline, that would be great. I'll get to, or Gail, did you want to talk about yours? Or so Gail's come and she's on, on screen here. What can you tell us about gut um dysbiosis, its effect on the body's ability to process nutrients and help the body to achieve balance and ultimately health? Do you think that a good place to begin when trying to lose weight? We look at that, that we look at that. If yes, to lose yes ab absolutely. And I do that with my clients. Um, and this is getting into the different stages of when we die. And I call it the priming for weight loss. And if we're already in a state of stress, um, if we've already got gut issues going on, and then we're going to put another stress on our body by restricting our calories, like to me, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So if you do have sort of gut issues, like the first thing I um, recommend is giving your gut a bit of a rest, like broths or, you know, bone broth is very good for this because what we're happening if we do have inflammation and stuff in the gut, that's where we're absorbing our nutrients and that can affect our ability to absorb nutrients and so we're not getting, number one, the best out of our foods that we're consuming but if we're eating inflammatory foods highly processed foods um, deli meats bakery foods these sort of things this can add to inflammation in the gut if we're you know high sugary foods uh, we're not having enough fiber in our diet um, this can exacerbate things so we just need to slow down you know nourishing foods and stuff to start with most as I said most people aren't eating enough um, vegetables in their diet especially your cruciferous greens are really good for gut health um, yes I think if yeah. I may if I may just if I may just intervene here gut health is another one of those big subjects so let's just nutshell it mm -hmm. into that to get your gut healthy would be the first step yeah. to 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 that lifelong healthy plan mm -hmm. the healthier the gut the better everything else in your body yes. works and the better yes. that you feel. So yes. that would be the nutshell answer to that. Um, another question, Caroline, that comes through. Yes, from Ali, um, he's on screen as well. Why does the body composition, fat mass, muscle mass, change when you measure it you, at, um, using different age, PA levels or HT for the same person? Which was, I think that's a bit of a cat. I think it's yeah, just, it's just in the yeah. chat box there. Our physical activity levels age. Yeah. So obviously as we age, um, we, you're losing, you know, you get sarcopenia and things like this um, with the elderly. And that's why exercise is important. Um, physical activity levels, like the, mo the more you use your muscle, if you're doing weights, then the muscle's going to grow. If you're not doing anything, you're getting um, at, atrophy um and then oh he said for the same person what's ht um H hi yeah. ali how are you <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so height so i meant to say height um, oh height, height. yes oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so just if it's me measured on the same person but you change the height or the physical activity levels or um um yeah or the age it seems like the body composition changes um, um. Person, 
Yeah, so, well, in terms of um, energy requirements, because a lot of this is on uh, probably prediction equations and, and things like like that, like the bigger the person you you have, like, and, and different body types as well. Um, I know that when, when we measure them in clinical trials, we use different um, different methods to measure body composition we're using like the dexa machine we're using another fancy like bod pod and we're putting them all um all together um and in terms of height height for the same person i can talk to you about this one um as well that mass and muscle change when you measure it using different age physical and in terms of energy requirements so if you're wanting to look how much Calories you should be eating, that is based on physical activity levels. Like someone who's sedentary, it's 1.5. Someone who's very active, it might be 1.8. And you're basically multiplying the physical activity level and that, that metabolic rate to get together. So that's how you get differences in calorie amounts. Um, does that sort of answer your question or not really? <laughs> it's mostly because um, so I use like um, BIA or so the... Um um sorry it's just uh, like sometimes if i'm measuring um like uh, body composition um like you know, using the bia yeah, um like right. the body composition is just different um if i accidentally put in the wrong age you know for someone um oh, and no, they would be yeah. on yeah they would be on standard categories and it's the same with like the meta standardized curves where they've measured yeah. them because like someone from 18 to 30 would have different energy requirements yeah. than someone who's like 30 to 60. Um, does it, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And yeah. then yeah. obviously height, you've got, um, so yeah, it's all based on probably curves um, right. and prediction yeah. equations mm -hmm. where they've mapped them out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. This is where you come back down to come back down to listening to your body and knowing who you are. You mm -hmm. can use this as a measure, but mm -hmm. you can have a 60 year old that can be fitter, stronger, mm -hmm. leaner than a 30 year old. Um, and the age is, is double, but the, the 60 year old's body is actually working at a better level than a 30 year old's body. I've experienced that. I've experienced that myself uh, across the board. So uh, I guess, again, you know, some of these some of these these guidelines are used mm -hmm. um, for, as guidelines and, and boundaries to work within but then it has to be personalized for the person doesn't it and mm -hmm. probably um, so body composition is not just fat and muscle it's also bone and water and yeah. okay. um, that's why you're measuring um, you should be measuring body composition fasted um, that's what we do when we're doing the DEXA scan to because we unless you're using deuterium or something to measure water and then bone obviously changes and you know bone mineral content goes down as well and then exercise is something that helps with um increasing bone mineral density so these are all yeah interconnected you know what i think that i think that if you're listening to this and you're now really totally confused um you know and you, and you, and you, and you, and you want to lose weight you know, just stop and think about number one, keep it really simple, go back to simple basics, okay, go back to simple basics, basic is how do you want to look and feel, number one, how do you want to look and feel, mm -hmm. and then go back to where you are now, sort of the very first thing that I, and I still do myself, I'm on stage in America in November, and I've got a pair of pants hanging on my wardrobe, because I'm wearing those in America in two months time, okay, I am wearing those pants, right now I can get them on, and there's a gap like this, mm -hmm. Okay, so I am using those pair of pants as a measure to what my body is doing on a weekly basis. Okay, um, so yes, so that's just a very, very simple measure. Find something in your wardrobe that's just a little uncomfortable, mm -hmm. just a little uncomfortable, so that so that as you go on this journey of first off listening to what, what your body is telling you, and then learning from a from a learning how to work with it on a deeper level, like reaching out to somebody, like you know, reaching out to Dr. Haley to see. She can help you really get inside what's going on with your body, but keep it simple. Get yeah. something out of your wardrobe that's too tight, whether you're a male or female. 
-hmm. just a little bit too tight and use that as a measure to start with. Now, if you are really, I remember I had a client once who had a gallstone and he wanted to know where the gallstone came from. So he, he was German, he used to come to the Gold Coast in Queensland a couple of times a year. He sent his gallstone to China to have it studied because he wanted to know where the gallstone came from. Now, if you're that person and you really, now that's extreme, of course, but if you're that person that wants to know scientifically what's going on with your body and you really want to get inside it and have all these tests, then you then you reach out to Dr. Haley because she's a person that can give you all of that information and share with you the right tests that you need to have to know it. But if you're like me, you just want to get into those pants, then just start thinking about everything we've talked about. Keep mm -hmm. it simple, gut health first. Mm -hmm. You know, move more, go and do those push-ups. And if you are a time short, how long does it take to do a couple of push-ups? How long does it take to walk up and down a few extra stairs? There's a lot of ways that we can help you know how to put exercise into a busy lifestyle. So I know that we're running out of time, hence me just summarizing all of this. Um, and it's, 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 it is really a big, big, big subject. And everything that Dr. Haley has talked about has got layers and layers and layers deep down and sideways that we can go into. But just to keep it simple again, please listen to what we're talking about. Just think mm -hmm. about what you want. Think mm -hmm. about how you want to look and feel. Think about what your starting point is. And here's the other thing. Think about what you don't like doing and do it anyway. Because mm -hmm. it's, in, it's when you're doing what you don't like that you're going to get the best results. And it doesn't matter whether that's weight loss or wealth, wealth creation. When you do what you don't want to do, you're going to get the better results. So in summary, summing up, Dr. Haley, it's just been amazing. And I know we could sit and talk about the subject for hours. Mm -hmm. um, we will have you back to discuss some of these other subjects sort of in more detail. But what would be three tips? Tips right now that you would suggest to people who are sitting there confused not about what we're talking about but confused about their body mm -hmm. they want to get into those pants that are a little bit too tight or that dress that's a little bit too tight they want to have more energy they want to sleep better um mm -hmm. they're sick of the saggy baggy bum what would you suggest that they do yeah. Very Sim simple so start with mapping out your goals like this is the first thing I think people aren't clear about what their actual goals are like how much are they struggling are you struggling with energy are you struggling with cravings are you wanting to lose weight like get really clear on that goal and then don't try and change like everything at once don't worry about going on a juice clan or cha changing the, you know, to the next diet fad or counting calories or macros or all these really complex things because it's too overwhelming. And I think most people just need to get back to the fundamentals, which is not skipping meals, you know, have a nice smoothie um, in the breakfast, um, you know, for in the morning for breakfast, lunch, something simple. It's got some, not, it's not just salad, you know, get your variety of your leafy greens and that that support gut health, you know, bean burgers, um, you know, reduce your processed foods, um, dinner as well, have something nourishing, you know, nuts, yogurt, um, you know, dark chocolate, have your glass of wine. Like uh, the next step would be to map out, you know, when when in the day you're having cravings or your energy levels a dip, you know, are you getting enough vegetables and stuff throughout the day? Because I do really find these things like in terms of fibre and protein, um, for women it's 25 grams a day. For um, your protein, 0.75 grams per kilogram of body weight. So I think anything like 45 to 70 grams, which I'm seeing with the work I'm doing with women is really a good starting point. You're not having to, don't be having your protein supplements three times a day. You can eat really simply and clean, clean. I don't even know if that's like a word, but just, um, and tasty, like really use like your, your herbs and, um, you know, if don't restrict yourself into good and bad foods. So, and the third thing, I, I really like the 80, 20 or 80, 90% 20 rule. So um, if you're doing it 80% of the time, good or relatively good, then you've got a bit of flex the other 20%. So start changing into getting, changing your mindset, losing the restriction, the fixation on food, you know, really working on getting just these simple things that support your gut health and energy levels, like good, clean food. Um, and then, then you can start 
focusing on the weight loss specifically, you know, and then that becomes easier to do. It does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yes, it does. It has it yeah. has to be simple. Yeah. And you know, be careful, be careful with this one, guys, because I mentioned Haley mentioned chocolate. That isn't a block of chocolate, that's a piece of chocolate. Um, because you know <laughs> you can have a block if you want, then you'd have Hayley. to skip a meal. <laughs> Hi Tom. You know, hello, sorry, I just um I lost internet, I lost the whole thing, so I do apologize. I, I was I could hear you though. Can I just add, I know we're sort of running short of time. Can I just add a quick um not so much a question, but I think at the end of the day, it's all about reward, you know, effort versus reward. What is it? Do, do you implement um, strategies or do you find out from the people that you work with what it is that they're trying to achieve and keep keep that at top of mind? Yes. Yeah, so I am frequently revisiting goals with um, the goals that we set out. I always map out three goals um, at the start when I, you know, we first get on a call and then we revisit those. And as we achieve those goals, we revisit them. Okay, do we want to add in another one? And like I've been working with um, since I've moved from still in academia, but doing my coaching business on the side. I've been working um, with one woman since November and she's lost over 15% of her body weight, kept it off for six months. And then she's stepped into, you know, didn't even want to go out to eat in public um, with her partner, super embarrassed, um, work meetings, really anxious that everyone's looking at her, wouldn't go to the gym because she's embarrassed in group classes you know, and now, and she was fine. She then, when she was going out for dinner, she would just order these stupid things off the menu and feel so guilty about it. She goes, I don't know why I'm doing this. And, you know, and then she feels like a failure and the anxiety around that. And we've worked on that. Okay, well, that's good. Let's work on, you know, we know an event's coming up. What are you going to order off the menu? Um, her gym class, she started going back to that and she's just landed her dream job. Um, she's actually on her way to move from Broome down to Perth as we speak. Um, just the confidence, you know, through boundary setting, not answering work calls after hours. So, you know, the goal, the, the main goals are still like there, but then they, as we get closer to them, other stuff comes up and then it's not, it's not about the weight anymore. It's about loving, you know, looking at herself in the mirror, like, oh goodness, that's, you know, so all these yeah. other things. So, and, and I, and I do say, she's like, oh, you know, when she got the job, she's like, oh, I just really feel like pasta. I'm like, go and have pasta. You know, I don't ever say like, if you're feeling like, something like I don't want you sitting there the whole day like we each week when we meet okay what is coming up are you missing anything from the meal plan what do you want to put in there okay yeah you know I have a whole heap of cheat sheets where they can sub in if they want fish or if they want chocolate or if they want you know so it's about rewiring this whole relationship with food that it's okay to if you've got a social event have some wine have some chocolate have you know, but know your limits. So yeah, definitely reward. And it's not, you're not creating eating disorders. It's a whole new approach to, you know, and a lot of them can't, they're like, oh, can you explain to me again why I'm, you know, eating more in this phase? Like, what are we doing? I, 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 am I not going to gain weight? Because we're so conditioned that, you know, just this whole way of thinking. So it's a, this massive rewiring. Um, well, I think, that I, I'm think doing. I think yeah. I think that's that's part mm -hmm. of the whole mm -hmm. process. We would mm -hmm. if we're helping, we're coaching mm -hmm. people on how to look at it as a lifestyle change, mm -hmm. and it's all about teaching them also how to just change the way they're looking at. It. And you're out for dinner, you're just out there to have fun, yeah. and and how to order simply and yes. clean. I think yeah. you know you we've we used the word clean. I think it's a powerful word because clean is very simple to see. I think the more the simpler we can make it so people can see it clean just means there's no crap on it mm -hmm. um and i've always had another rule of thumb is that if you don't know what's in it you don't eat it it's yeah. that simple if you yeah. don't know what's in it don't eat it mm -hmm. um and of course that's that's another um, healthy healthy gut strategy mm -hmm. okay that is absolutely wonderful you are amazing as i said we could sit and talk for hours and hours and hours i think we need to have a we need to have a session on men and their bellies i think that's a yeah. great session to have yes. men and their bellies <laughs> 
um, because, you know, that's a whole market in itself, isn't it? The men and the belly thing. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Haley. You have been amazing. Guys, if you want help, reach out to us. Let us connect you with Dr. Haley. Learn more about how you can listen to your body. Listen to what it's telling you. Listen to what you want and only listen to people who know how to help you. Get rid of the opinions and the diets and the social media. Switch off from all of it. Mm -hmm. You've got to start to, re to rewire. You need to start thinking about what you think about, who you're putting yourself in front of. Mm -hmm. Just focus on what you, where you are now, what you want, and what are those gaps? How can we help you fill those gaps? Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, everybody on screen. Thank you, everybody out there watching us. Have a really super wonderful day. Yeah. We'll, be back. we'll be back next week. Dr. Haley, thank you. You are amazing. Let's do this again and pick a subject <laughs> that we can really get into yeah. um, and have a be safe. You're doing some amazing work and congratulations on your business. It's all very exciting we know that you're going to be making a difference to so many more people's lives to get rid of the confusion let's get some clarity on how you can live in the body that you love have a wonderful day guys see you next monday thank you yeah. <laughs>